Good evening. My name is Roberta Wood. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Communist Party. The Communist Party of Vietnam has always sent delegates to our conventions of the Communist Party here in the United States. And in 2014, they urgently appealed to us to make a return visit, and we accepted that invitation. Our histories are, we have very warm and fraternal relations with many parties around the world, but our relationship with the Communist Party of Vietnam is especially heartfelt on both sides. Our histories are tied together, as are many of our lives. So many of us came of age politically during the American War on Vietnam, and we were longtime allies against the same enemy, U.S. imperialism. On our side, we appreciated the relentless fighting and sacrifice of an entire people struggling for their independence. It was a fight that awakened the American people and it helped to build a new progressive movement in our country. On their part, the Vietnamese repeatedly expressed appreciation for the support of the anti-war movement, including our party, and the role that it played in ending that history of aggression. Our part was smaller, but both parts were necessary to end that war. So we set off across the globe. On the way, we saw some disturbing signs of the polar ice cap melting and environmental detriment, det the detriment of the environment. And here we are arriving in Ho Chi Minh City the next day, a bustling metropolis formerly known as Saigon. We're also connected with the Communist Party of Vietnam through our common history of the world communist movement. An early leader, Ho Chi Minh, was not just a leader of Vietnam, but a, a leader of the world movement. In fact, he spent two years in the United States where he worked as a worker, as a baker, in the Parker House Hotel in Boston. And while in Boston, frequently visited the Boston Public Library where he read our Declaration of Independence, which many parts of which made its way into a Vietnam's constitution. Ho Chi Minh was traveling the world trying to find how to build the fight against the colonial situation of his homeland. And he excelled in the tactics of building unity. Under his leadership, there was a communist party that was built that had a very special relationship to the Vietnamese people. They had endured a thousand years of Chinese domination, including 12 major invasions, a hundred years of French and Japanese occupation. Rebellions led by scholars, by peasants, by religious forces had all failed. It was the Communist Party of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh's leadership that was able to rally the forces that were both domestically and international that showed a successful path to national independence. Thus, the Communist Party in Vietnam is seen as a leader of the whole people, not a segment and not a partisan political party. The purpose of our trip was one, because to strengthen the historical relation of our two parties. Besides those um, long-standing ties, we wanted to build the friendship between the peoples of our two countries. And we especially wanted to learn about socialism. We wanted to see new models, learn from the study of the Vietnamese people, to see what they were doing on the ground. And fourth, we wanted to explore increasing our solidarity, never to forget the struggle for reparations for war damage. So let me show you here our delegation, uh, who are, most of us are with you tonight. On the left is David Trujillo. David's a member of the National Committee of the Communist Party and a retired union organizer of health care workers. David couldn't join us. He's recovering from eye surgery, but he sends his greetings. Next to him in the red shirt is John Bechtel. John is the national chairman of the Communist Party. Next is yours truly. And on the right is Chauncey Robinson. Chauncey is a member of our national board and the social media editor of 
people's world next to her is one of the many wonderful people who helped guide us. So the most exciting thing I think you could say that's happening in Vietnam is the economy. And before I show you, I turn the uh, chair over to Chauncey, I just wanted to introduce you to our hosts during our tour. And there they are, uh, three um, representatives of the Exterior Relations uh, Committee of the Communist Party of Vietnam. On the left is Comrade Chum. She's a recent graduate of Brown University, studied international relations, and very all three are very fluent in English. Um, in the middle is Comrade Gui. He is um, the head of that department. Um, Gui um, has made many trips to the United States, is very um, knowledgeable about conditions here, a superb translator and um, politician, and he has a very um, interesting history as a soldier in the um, War for Liberation. And in the white shirt is our comrade Swan, who made most of the arrangements for our trip and is uh, studied in uh, Holland International Relations and is also a um, very devoted party member. So those are our hosts. Uh, bring back the cranes and Chauncey's going to talk a little bit um, about the socialist oriented market economy. Okay, Chauncey. Hello. Hi. Um, as uh, Roberta said, my name is Chauncey Robinson. I'm uh, on the I'm social media editor for People's World, and also on the national board of the um, Communist Party. And I'm you know really excited to share some of um, some of the thoughts and things that we went through um, on our um, delegation of our 10 day or so trip. Um, one of the first po topics I wanted to just kind of touch on, and I'm sure people might have questions towards the end, is on the um, socialist market, um, socialist oriented market economy that uh, we actually got to do a really great in-depth interview with Boy Jiang, who uh, Roberta um, spoke of just a moment ago, one of our hosts, who gave a really comprehensive um, view on what uh, Vietnam is doing in terms of, you know, development um, on their road, on their path towards socialism, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And I just wanted to start it off by actually giving a um, showing the video that we actually put in the People's World, and it's also on the CPUSA.org website of, um, of, of, of Boy's um, interview that I um, conducted that uh, John Bechtel actually uh, helped to film. So I'm going to uh, show that, just a, just a clip bit of it, and then I'll just kind of talk about it a little bit. Economically, ideologically, politically, but okay, we're not seeing your screen. You can't see it now? Okay. No, we can't see your screen. Can you see it now? No. I just shared, I turned on the share. Okay. Okay, so now, have... now we see your screen. Okay. So start it from where you wanted to start it. And that is part of what you call market economy, private sector, participation in the economy. But the socialist orientation is meant by parties' leadership. So far, until this point of time, the Communist Party of Vietnam remains, has remained the only political party in power in my country. Um, second, the state sector remains the leading, the leading sector of the economy to avoid any deviation economically, ideologically, politically, but my surface orientation we also meet. So that was just um, a little snippet of um, what uh, what I got to discuss with um, Boy um, when it came to um, the socialist oriented market economy that um, Vietnam is um, doing. Um, just to, and I and there's and people can actually find the full transcript 
of that interview. It's about 20 minutes or so long on the PW and also on the CPUSA.org's website. Um, just to talk on it a little bit, um, you know, one of the things when you hear the word socialist orientated market economy, it does seem to have, like for myself as a younger person as well, it can have a little bit of a, um, you, you kind of feel like it might be somewhat contradicting because you're like socialist but also market economy. And Boy does a really good job, um, a really great job um, in the interview of explaining um, what that actually means. And we saw a little snippet of that in the video itself. Um, one of the things um, that Boy discussed with us was uh, talking about the 30-year uh, renewal process that Vietnam has been going through since the you know times of after um, being a country that was ravished with war, back-to-back -back wars for some time. And they call this the comprehensive renewal process. And um, there's been gains and also um, a, a, an acknowledgement of the dangers that they still face um, in dealing with um, this process of, of, of moving towards socialism. Um, one of the things that we saw in the video was how um, Boy um, defined the uh, socialist market, uh, socially orientated market economy, which was the fact that private sector uh, participates in the participates in the economy, um, but with uh, a socialist orientation, which means that the Communist Party basically um, is in the leadership of 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 the economy, that they are still the political um, leadership of the whole economy. Um, and it's the only, and as Boy um, talks about, it's the only political party in power um, there. Um, and one of the interesting things that he actually points out in the interview is that he doesn't consider Vietnam, or they don't consider Vietnam yet to be um, socialist yet, or, or communist. Yeah, and it's something that they're they're moving towards um, because they said when they first um, you know had the revolution that they jumped right into it, but then they soon realized that it wasn't something that um, was it wasn't something that was um, correct to say because of the fact that you know they were still suffering from famine and other um, issues that they needed to work on in order to you know uh, development and whatnot. So um, that's one of the things he um, highlights. In that, and then there's been pros since this renewal process um, has began, such as you know the poverty rate going down, um, an improvement in the infrastructure, and a state, and you know a state, I'm sorry, stable um, politically uh, that attracts uh, investors. Um, you know, one of the things is that he pointed out that in Vietnam it's very peaceful, and one of the things that foreign investors don't have to worry about is acts of terrorism and whatnot like that. So that actually makes them very, um, you know, uh, uh, appealing to uh, to investors and whatnot. Um, and also one of the things that they've been doing is being a part of the international community, which is uh, basically helping other countries who are developing to, you know, learn from some of the um, advancements that uh, Vietnam has made uh, when it comes to, you know, some of the things that they're doing with the economy and whatnot. He mentioned some um, places in Africa and others. Um, so with that, though, there comes dangers. Um, I at first in the interview with Boy had called it challenges, but he wanted to, he corrected me and said, we don't call it challenges, we call it dangers, which, you know, means they take it very seriously about some of the um, issues that they deal with and they're still dealing with. Three of the main ones that Boy actually points out when it comes to this renewal process is corruption, um, lagging behind other countries, and the peaceful evolution. And I'm going to describe, I'm going to also um, just kind of describe what the peaceful evolution is as well. Um, when it comes to corruption, he explained that that's a problem that they're very much dealing with when it comes to, um, I'm sorry, I just need to pause for a second. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying is that he described that there were three um, dangers that they deal with, which was corruption, um, the peaceful evolution, and also lagging behind other countries. With the lagging behind other countries, um, one of the things, what, what he was talking about was dealing with, you know, technology, always wanting to uh, be as advanced as the other countries. Um, and, you know, we, we heard in our um, trip some examples of that, you know, when it comes to um, technology in the factories, things like that, being able to compete and be just as, um, once again, inviting to investors and whatnot. Um, the other 
one is corruption, which is something that, you know, we also heard uh, throughout our trip, which was, you know, dealing with, um, you know, people in um, official leadership and whatnot who, you know, uh, might fall victim to corruption um, and that they do have corruption laws in place, but it's still something that they, they deal with often. Um, in the interview, Boy actually uh, mentions how he gives the example of how easy it can be, how tempting corruption can be when it comes to putting it in context of where Vietnam was in terms of poverty and famine and whatnot, that he used the, he, he used the example where he said, you know, if I had not eaten before and then suddenly I can eat all the time, I may want to, you know, continue to eat. Um, he he, he um, used that example to kind of put it in perspective of how people can fall victim to corruption, but it's something that they still fight against. And one of the ways they fight against that is through education, um, through uh, reinforcing the teachings of um, Ho Chi Minh. Um, they call him, you know, um, Uncle Ho Chi Minh um, there, um, and also Lenin and, and Marx. Um, and, you know, one of the things as well is that, you know, they have leadership that's coming in that isn't part of the um, – isn't from the war times as well. You have a younger set of leadership coming in and whatnot, and also still with that, continuing to reinforce the teachings and you know and 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 remembering that history of where they they come from. Um, the other, the third danger was the uh, peaceful evolution, which um, sounds nice, but it's actually you know as we would understand it here in the U.S., it actually deals with um, what we would call a counter revolution. Uh, where it's forces that, um, you know, who are against the revolution, who basically want to um, go against the revolution. But by peaceful evolution, what they mean is that they're not using arms and the military or anything like that. What they're doing is more subtle, subversive kind of ways, such as, uh, uh, such as uh, um, you know, um, trying to corrupt others with money, you know, playing into the corruption factor, things like that, enticing um, people away from wanting to work um, towards towards their goals as towards uh, Vietnam's goals and whatnot like that. So um, those are the three main dangers that they're still dealing with, and they're very much aware of it. And, you know, what, what I saw, you know, just from the interview and just in learning, getting a, a little bit more of a comprehensive understanding of what they mean by socialist orientated market economy is that this is a country that's very much taking a very sobering and I think um, uh, level-headed way in going about, you know, what they need to do in terms of needing to develop in order to be able to get to that point of the, the goal. And because they do see the socialist oriented market economy as a transition. It's not the end goal, but the end goal is, you know, socialism and communism. Um, so that's just a, an overview about that highlight that was, uh, I think, very interesting in terms of uh, what they're doing in Vietnam. So I'll give it back to uh, the next person. Okay. Thank you, Chauncey. Um, so um, now I wanted to give a couple um, examples of some of what Chauncey t spoke about in the socialist uh, market, socialist-oriented market economy. Um, as she said, the, that has removed the centrally planned mechanism and developed a multi-sector economy. So we, vis we had the opportunity to visit two different um, enterprises. The first one I wanted to talk about was called the Rangdung um, Lighting Source Factory. Uh, let me show you some of their, here's some of the things. These are, look pretty familiar to us that they produce. Um, they make uh, what we call CFLs, compact fluorescent lights, the new uh, energy efficient lighting as well as the old incandescent lights um, and other products. This company has uh, 2,600 workers. It was uh, built in 1968 and it was state owned until 12 years ago when it became what they call a joint stock company. Um, they were not able to become an up-to-date manufacturing concern without a huge input of investment, which the state did not have. So uh, these resources to make the kind of investment needed just didn't exist in Vietnam, and they would be stuck behind, falling further and further behind. So the solution to that uh, challenge was to equitize, what they call equitize 
meaning taking in investments. And the workers um, who work there were given the first uh, opportunity to be the investors. And over years, many of them invested their um, own finance, their own bonuses to be able to finance the installation and development of new production lines. And here's a couple of the new, very um, state-of-the-art uh, production. Um, th this also included uh, sending them overseas for intensive training um, and, and keeping that up and a huge staff of scientists and so on to develop, uh, develop their product. Uh, here's some of the workers also on the assembly line. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, a little bit about, oh, here's some of the scientific workers at work. Uh, the, the board of uh, management of the company makes the decisions on the strategy of the company, and they plan for the production and profit distribution. We met some of these members, and uh, here they are with us, um, these three women, two women here, and the man in the middle is the general manager. Um, they had all been longtime workers in the plant. They told us um, that um, they, under the TPP, they would be able to sell their products to 11 uh, nations. But on the other hand, they confided in us that foreign companies have poured in investments to our country to take advantage of TPP. The policy of our country is to attract foreign investment to allow for development. Meanwhile, our Vietnam enterprises are facing difficulties and we're worried about challenging facing us. So John Bechtel asked him, uh, aren't you worried about uh, this? And he, the, he answered very candidly, I'm always worried. This is the biggest question facing us. So we found this again and again in Vietnam. They don't sugarcoat the challenges, but they know the battle they have to fight. Um, I wanted to introduce you to one of the workers on the line. Um, she um, is also a member of the Communist Party. This woman, though, the reason I took her picture, she has a new baby, and she works only seven hours a day. Women with children under one get an extra hour off every day. And she also received six months uh, paid maternity leave, paid at the minimum wage rate. Uh, the workers at this plant generally make about uh, the equivalent of $500 a month, uh, which is quite high for Vietnamese uh, workers. The general wages of workers um, in Vietnam range from 200 to 220 a month. So that's one enterprise. Now I wanted to show you a completely different kind. This was um, we actually wanted to go see a, a a factory that makes Nike shoes, but the management wouldn't let us in. Uh, we were kind of disappointed because we knew they had had many strikes in the recent period, but this other substitute visit turned out to be quite enlightening. So this is the Phu Mai Hung New City Center. Uh, here it is. This is a enormous, this is only a tiny piece of this project. Overwhelming project. They're building a city within the city of Ho Chi Minh City on what was formerly uh, marshland. Uh, you now, when I tell you what this is about, you're going to find it strange for us to get excited about a project that's aimed at housing millionaires and upper middle class families, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, it's being built in a very modern, green uh, way with six giant clusters of, of uh, homes, businesses, apartments, shopping districts, where each one has everything available in a walkable distance. The total population will be 100,000 people when it's finished, and some of the homes sell for up to $3 million. Actually, the complex feels like a huge gated community. Um, it includes this enormous parkway you can see with many lanes of traffic, and in the center is a space reserved for uh, what's going to be a uh, subway or a tram. Um, so why are we excited? <laughs> about millionaire housing. Um, this is a money-making project. It's being led or organized by a Taiwan corporation that will turn into a money machine for Vietnam's economy. And I did ask what the amount of the investment would they wouldn't let, tell me that, but um, I'm sure uh, given the scale of it, it's in the billions. But just to make up a figure, let's say it was $1 billion. The, um, that's a billion from the investors. The Vietnam state has a uh, 
thirty percent stake in this because they're because of their providing the land. That means they get thirty percent of the profits. So say you had a ten percent per year return, they'd be getting to the state thirty million a year in profits. In addition, there's a twenty five percent tax on profits, which would bring in another twenty five million. So of course then there's the wages paid to the workers and the money spent in the economy on building materials. So this fifty million dollars from this project becomes a pot of money that the country of Vietnam can spend every year on building homes, schools, health care and very important infrastructure investment for Vietnam that otherwise it couldn't be. And this, you know, like having my mind changed about why are they showing us this and then realizing it made me think that, you know, in developed capitalist countries like the U.S., we take our infrastructure for granted. Our infrastructure, which doesn't just include sewers, bridges, and roads, but also machinery, computers, education facilities, is, it has been built over centuries with the primitive accumulation of capital, the capital from slavery, from the colonial spoils, from exploitation of workers. And in the U.S., we now have a GDP of $50,000 per person. But Vietnam's infrastructure can only produce a GDP of $2,000 a person, 50 and 2. Half of Vietnam's workforce is still tied up in agriculture. But in the U.S., we only need 2% of our workforce to produce all our food. So Vietnam's um, challenge or uh, at is how can those 48 percent be freed up to contribute to the economy? They need advanced farm machinery, irrigation, food storage, and processing facilities. This costs billions or tens or hundreds of billions. So the cold hard fact is that they must have modern machinery to survive in the world economy and the only place they can get it is from investment. So they try to make the rules governing the treatment of workers but they accept that in accepting investment they will not receive the full value of their work. They don't claim to have a socialist economy. They say they're trying to lay the basis for it. So now I'd like to spend a minute or two on the political system. Uh, we hear a lot um, that the um, Vietnam, well, let me show you. Here's my infrastructure picture. Okay, now we hear a lot that Vietnam is a one uh, party state. Uh, that is really not an accurate description. I don't think it recognizes the special nonpartisan role played by the Communist Party. Um, it is the Communist Party it has ties to families, to communities, to the country's history. It's the spirit and soul of the country which led it out of colonialism. Um, and I would say that uh, Vietnam doesn't have political parties, at least as we should know, uh, parties are not synonymous with democracy. In fact, the United States was founded, our founding fathers had the idea that there would not be parties. Um, but Vietnam certainly has democratic processes and practices built in. And we were lucky to be visiting the country just as it was conducting its elections for its National Assembly, which occur every five years. And let me introduce you to the new head of the National Assembly, a woman. Um, a very dynamic woman, and the people uh, were quite excited. We overheard a conversation in the park. These three women, what were they talking about? The, the new woman leader of the National Assembly. Um, we met with um, a comrade from the theoretical council, Vu Vien Hien, and he shared his personal experience of how he got elected to the National Assembly as a delegate. So it would be like a, a member of Congress. He said, I was nominated by the uh, Central Committee of the Party. I had to go to my ward where he lived to ask for comments from people. I also needed comments by my workplace colleagues. I had to respond to questions from constituents. And then the Fatherland Front, which is a, a coalition of uh, civic organizations, compiled all of this. I had to go to the local media in my town and in my neighborhood there were four people running for the one position. We all had to appear on the local media and answer questions. One man appeared but he couldn't get any support. People said, 
you don't treat your wife well, you beat your children, he ultimately dropped out. So, you know, last week I saw a New York Times article um, sharply criticizing Vietnam because they said before people could get elected to the National Assembly, they had to be vetted. Well, this was the vetting process, and um, I think it's a good demonstration of uh, democracy, and it might even make some people think about the, some similarities to the Democratic Party's primary caucuses. So in Vietnam, they're still studying the forms democracy can take in a socialist-oriented society, and they're very self-critical. They want to make their party education more lively, just like we do. And in fact, they're experimenting with online forms, like we are, and with TV. They're very determined. Um, so while there aren't any political parties, the civil society is formally included in the political process. And as I mentioned, the Fatherland Front, which is sort of a national coalition of women's groups, youth groups, labor, religious, veterans, um, has a part, uh, you know, is part, participates in the elections. For example, the Buddhist uh, groups choose their own reps. Um, again, this comes out of the history of the party and its lead on building unity. It might make you remember the National Liberation Front and how it brought together all of these forms. Unions have a special responsibility to come up with labor legislation. Um, they're, so they're part of the government, unlike um, the role that unions have in the United States where they have to work from outside. And some important recent legislation has been a passage of the 40-hour work week. Uh, they've had several raises of the minimum wage over the last few years. In fact, last year it went up to 12. It went up by 12 percent. Um, they have affirmative action program for national minorities, um, and um, they're exploring um, how to deal with gender discrimination. And interestingly enough, they're getting assistance from the AFL-CIO in doing that. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to John, who's going to speak about U.S. and Vietnam relations. John? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'll assume you can. Um, well, this was really a, a wonderful trip that we took, and um, we learned so much, um, and we, had, we have such uh, fond memories, especially of the warm welcome that we received when we went there. Um, it's really great that we're able to have this uh, webinar right now because, eh, you know, Vietnam has been in the news the last few days because of President Obama's uh, visit. We didn't realize that, um, you know, when we set the date for this uh, webinar. Uh, we did know that he was planning on coming there, and they talked about his visit, um, and I think we're very excited about it. Uh, Obama's the uh, first president, U.S. president, not the first U.S. president to visit uh, both um, uh, President Clinton and President Bush uh, visited earlier, but he's the first one who actually grew up, I guess you could say post, um, uh, you know, uh, war. Although he was a teenager, I guess when it was when it was over, but. Um, and I think it's at, at this very moment, you know, it's a very important time in the history of both both our countries. Uh, and it, it, you know, from Vietnam's standpoint, um, it's important because they are in this process, as Chauncey was saying, of um, taking these steps toward uh, integration into the global economy. Um, and it's not one that they have any illusions about. Uh, they realize that it's a uh, an unequal uh, global economy that's dominated by um, not only U.S. capital but global capital, global transnational corporations, but they see it as a necessary um, part of this process of building socialism, of attracting foreign investment and, and uh, trade and so on. Um, oh, President Obama in his speech, it's a very interesting speech that he made in Hanoi and I would urge everybody to take a look at it. Um, he talked about the uh, partnership between the two countries. Now, you know, we can, of course, have our own interpretations of what that means, but, um, you know, from the standpoint of the two countries, um, 
you know, it's uh, trade, it's investment, um, and obviously for many U.S. corporations, you know, it's a place for low-wage uh, uh, production, you know, of goods and, and so on. Um, but it's also a, a partnership in terms of cooperation on a number of levels. Uh, they talk about, for example, you know, disaster relief, um, education. You know, there are uh, not only uh, uh, a lot of Vietnamese students who are now studying in the United States, uh, but there's also now a cooperation with a number of education institutions in in the U.S. to um, you know, not only open up uh, facilities there, but also to um, uh, actually, you know, conduct classes and so on. Um, very important area is environmental and the climate climate crisis, and both U.S. of course and Vietnam are signatories to the U.N. climate um, uh, agreement, which was held, you know, reached in Paris. But it's a very important. Um, from the standpoint of, of Vietnam, you know, they have this 2,000-mile coast, um, and they are really being affected already by rising uh, seawaters uh, and, and drought, uh, which uh, they told us, for example, Ho Chi Minh City, which is pretty close to the coast, and um, I guess by 2050, they expect it to be two-thirds underwater if they don't take big precautions and steps. The same thing, there's the salination of the Mekong Delta region, which is like the rice producing region of the world in, in some respects. Um, and so they, there's these huge, enormous uh, challenges that they have, which uh, will take global cooperation you know, to solve, including with the U.S. Um, of course, there is the, the uh, military uh, cooperation, which is, I think, Probably very surprising for us, and um, and it's uh, on a number of the levels, <clears throat> including that uh, the U.S. government just dropped its uh, ban on uh, sales of military hardware to the uh, Vietnamese. Um, but it also uh, includes uh, Coast Guard training and U the United Nations peacekeeping and, and so on. And then uh, lastly is the cooperation which is expected to come about through the TPP, which of course we have very different viewpoints on it, um, but they see it as a necessary step for global investment uh, and they recognize again the unequal aspects of global trade that are dominated by not only U.S. but also global uh, transnational corporations, but they believe that it's something that they can deal with. <clears throat> so for example, Bobby mentioned the uh, many laws that they have, including a uh, new labor law which was passed a couple of years ago. They have their own minimum wage. They have other laws uh, dealing with the environment and, and so on. And I think in the end, the la especially the labor stipulations, I don't think will be a big deal in terms of independent trade unions. I think they'll find a way to work around that. Um, but all this stuff should be seen, I think, in the bigger picture of that is U.S.-Vietnamese relations uh, in the bigger picture of the so-called pivot to Asia by the U.S., uh, the Obama administration, which is being carried out in fits and starts, uh, but one that, you know, obviously sees China, you know, as a, now as the big rival, um, but doesn't see any way of so-called containment, a containment strategy. Uh, you rec it recognizes China as a global power that dominates the region and will dominate the region and will continue to grow in strength. Um, but it sees developing relations with other countries, uh, including Vietnam, as uh, their way around this. Um, and also sees the uh, huge market, you know, um, in that whole region. I mean, this is these are you know hundreds of millions of uh, People obviously billion and and point one point two billion in China alone, uh, but you have a very young population. You know, I think 
at least in Vietnam, half the population now is under 30 years of age, but that's true uh, throughout, uh, throughout the region. Uh, so that's one big thing. The other big thing is that the whole region is being militarized. Um, it's not just U.S. Uh, mil you know, military there, which is, I think, the biggest, obviously, many military bases and so on. Um, but, uh, it, you know, China. China is uh, increasing its military presence. Uh, Japan, which with this right-wing government that it has, is, um, you know, uh, building up its uh, military. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think there is even some talk of... Uh, uh, changing its constitution and, and so on. You have a new president in the Philippines who is kind of a loose cannon. And some people call him a Trump. You know, so you have a un unstable situation there. You have the situation with the two Koreas um, and uh, the nuclearization of uh, North Korea and and a DPRK. Um, so really, it's going to take, I think, all the governments. Um, and all the world's peoples or the peoples of these countries to really solve this issue and to, um, you know, demilitarize the region. That's a very important thing, which I think we have to fight for. It goes counter to, you know, this new uh, development um, of modernizing uh, the U.S. nuclear weapons. Um, and But it's something that I don't think... Uh, one country alone can deal with, but it's got to be all the countries together, and especially the people of the country have to uh, really assert themselves. The people of the United people of the United States have to really insist on on the denuclearization of the of the region and the demilitarization of the region. It relates very closely to this issue, which is before us, which is the growing tensions in the South China Sea, um, and that you know there you have. Uh, you know, China, which is uh, basically asserting its rights um, and has been um, doing things in international waters uh, and in, in the waters of Vietnam, including setting up drilling rigs and, and, and so on. So it's, it's concerns, you know, um, especially the Vietnamese because of they've had this historic uh, relationship with China. Uh, they were dominated by China for a thousand years and then um, you know, uh, in 1979, they, they had this uh, war uh, with China uh, when they had invaded from the north. And so there's, there's these historic kind of relationship tensions, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> which exist there. And so they're very concerned, obviously, about what's, what's uh, going on. And they see it as an infringement on their territorial waters uh, and their territory. So... Um, you know the uh, U.S. in some ways is taking is taking advantage of that, uh, and um, so you have these kind of unlikely allies. Uh, although through it all, um, the Vietnamese have maintained their relationship with the Chinese uh, government and people, and including uh, some forms of military cooperation. So it's it's a little hard to exactly see you know, where this is all headed, but for certain, you know, they uh, are concerned about it, would like to see a peaceful resolution to this and to be able to deal with these issues um, in the context of international law and, inter and negotiation, and they, I feel, think they feel confident that they can, uh, can do that. Um, Lastly, I think what's really important for from our standpoint are people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, this, uh, you know, what's happening now, I think, opens up uh, so many new opportunities for cooperation, for development of um, friendship, uh, for um, all kinds of tourism, uh, you know. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was like, Gets a little surprised at was the scope of the cooperation with all kinds of uh, U.S. organizations, with NGOs and others. Uh, when we met with um, the uh, uh, Vietnamese Trade Union uh, Confederation, um, 
they told us that they had been a guest at, had been invited and been a guest at the uh, last AFL-CIO convention, uh, which was held in Los Angeles. And um, they have kind of entered into a cooperative agreement to some regard, to, in some respects, with the AFL-CIO, and um, you know they're taking advantage of uh, you know being of training um, in uh, shop steward system, and uh, I forget the the other kinds of things that they're doing. Uh, but in any in any case, it is a it is a, a cooperation that they have going with the AFL-CIO, um, and uh, that will continue, you know. Um, and uh, as we go forward, uh, particularly as this, you know, US, U.S. investment, U.S. corporations uh, invest more in Vietnam and also global transnational corporations, and there's a need for global uh, labor solidarity. Um, and by the way, just, uh, you know, we also found out, or I guess you've probably seen in the news that there have been a number of strikes of uh, U.S. and foreign corporations there uh, by Vietnamese workers. Uh, there's, I think, last year there were something like a thousand wildcat strikes. So the labor movement there is, uh, you know, not taking any of this uh, lightly, and is, uh, uh, but the workers there in particular are also fighting for their rights uh, as well. So. Anyway, I think, again, this just opens up a lot of opportunities for all kinds of cooperation and, and uh, working together, you know, uh, people to people. And that can be, I think, the most powerful factor as we go forward in the relationship between our two countries. That's it. Thanks, John. Um, Chauncey was going to give us a, a little picture about some of the important issues relating to um, solidarity. And Agent Orange. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna. Uh, I can uh, talk just briefly um, about that since I know people might have questions or comments they they want to have. Um, but we also one of the things we got to do in going to the um, to Vietnam on the delegation was visiting with the Vietnam Association for Victims of Agent Orange, which um, is a you know a, a really uh, great organization that's about trying to well, one of the things that they're aiming for um, is to uh, to is the fight to get the U.S. to take full responsibility uh, for you know the um, you know the tragedy of, of Agent Orange that we're still feeling today. You know, for people who might not know what Agent Orange is or the you know exact. Um, think of it, um, you know, it was first considered so-called herbal warfare, but eventually it was, you know, um, it, it became known that it was actually affecting human beings, and of course it became, you know, chemical warfare, and, you know, it's something that we, you know, especially for younger sets of people, um, you know, we've heard about it in the textbooks, we've seen, you know, really um, intense and tragic pictures of it, but it's not something, it's something that we think might be um, distant, many might feel that it's distant from us today, and one of the things I learned um, being part of this delegation and in, one, in, in that meeting in particular is that, you know, the effects of Agent Orange are still being felt um, by the Vietnamese people today and also um, by um, those who uh, fought in the Vietnam War in the, uh, from the U.S. as well. Um, in Vietnam, you know, there's a fourth generation being affected through, you know, various ways such as birth defects and deformities and health issues, cancers, um, as young as three to five years old. Um, there in Vietnam, um, and also um, in the U.S., that, where there was an estimated uh, an estimate of 2.4 million um, U.S. military personnel who were exposed. Um, you know, there was a class. You know, there was a class action lawsuit er earlier on, like in the 1980s, that was settled. But that that settlement actually um, ran out, and many of the people who um, the that and there was only an average about of about three thousand eight hundred dollars given out to some of the the veterans of the war, which is of course not nearly not enough to deal with, you know, the ramification of health issues that, you know, Agent Orange um, can and has um, affected um, those those who were exposed to it. So um, just quickly, there's you know there's a campaign um, to uh, get to the U.S. to um, fully acknowledge and 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 also 
to um, hold accountable the over 30 companies such as Dow um, Chemical and Mon Monsanto Corporation who were um, part of um, supplying um, Agent, or Agent Orange to um, Vietnam um, during the war. During the war. Um, and so there's um, currently um, that the association we met with is um, trying to get a lawsuit um, acknowledged. Currently, it's been getting it's been thrown out um, as having no real evidence. As, as the U.S. court saying um, it has no evidence um, to to really any concrete evidence to to hold against. But um, they're they're still fighting for that, along with the um, Victims of Agent Orange Relief Act that is trying to get passed here in the U.S. Um, it, it's been a, it's been brought around about three times already. I, I believe the first one was in 2012, and then it was like 2013. And now, like 2015 is the latest one, and it still has not been, um, you know, um, passed. And and this is you know an, an act that would take steps towards you know taking care of the the, the victims of Agent Orange. Um, so that's something that we can get involved with here and, you know, and calling our Congress people um, and calling our government and, and pushing and, and, and getting um, this to be um, taken up and taken seriously. Um, not only that, but, you know, young people getting involved in understanding that it's something that's still affecting us today. Um, and it's some, and it's a campaign we should get behind and that, you know, Vietnam and, and, and our relations with it isn't something that's in the past, and, but our countries are very much intertwined. Um, and it's something that uh, for millennials and o others to, to fully be aware of. So I just wanted to touch on that briefly. And you can also read more about that um, and some other developments, recent developments regarding it um, in the people's world and on cpusa.org. Okay, thanks, Chauncey. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up. Um, I just want to mention that um, you can read a lot of articles uh, by John has a wonderful article, Chauncey has a wonderful article, David Trujillo has several on peoplesworld.org. You need to click, they won't be on the home page anymore, but if you click on world and scroll down you should be able to find them. So um, I wanted to um, end on a kind of a nice note. One way that the uh, that Vietnam is seeking to fulfill its goals of both international friendship and economic development is through its tourism industry. Um, and we were so fortunate to have an opportunity to visit Ha Long Bay. Um, this is a beautiful um, site. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a beautiful bay on the Pacific. Um, it's um, uh, it's, it has full uh, beautiful beaches, but it has these eerie uh, limestone forms, uh, and it has caves. We were there on a beautiful misty day, but we were even assured that it's even more beautiful um, in the sunlight. Not only that, but um, well, here's some of us on our boat here enjoying the view. But uh, in addition to the uh, what you see over the surface, under the surface, it's some wonderful seafood you can't find anywhere else in the world. It's so um, enticing that um, even this uh, vegetarian here had to break down and uh, break his rules and indulge. So it is a dangerous thing. Well, there's also wonderful. I know you got that on camera. <laughs> yeah. uh, beautiful, delicious, exotic fruits. In Vietnam, um, I'm just going to show you a few other sites, historic Buddhist temple, um, here's some wonderful bridge, and we visited with some cute school kids. Um, the Vietnamese have assured us that they um, are respecting their culture and everything done there will be to maintain it. The teachers who, here are the teachers who met us when we visited a school all dressed in their native costumes. And um, not only that, but you, can, besides seeing the beautiful sights uh, in Vietnam, you also have an opportunity to relax, as Chauncey shows us here. Um, mm -hmm. So we hope you'll, there we go. So um, we hope we can entice people to save up and go visit Vietnam and experience some of what we did.
So now uh, I guess we should open the floor for uh, questions and discussion. Okay, if you have a question or want to make a comment, please uh, use your raised hand icon and your mic will be opened. If you have a question or you want to make a comment, please click your raised hand icon, okay? James, your mic is open. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, I didn't know it worked. I have a question for Chauncey. I didn't quite understand uh, what you you meant about the peaceful revolution. Sounded interesting, but I also was confused about um, what it was about. Sure, I can. I just I can answer that real quick. Um, well, why don't, yeah. we, why don't we? Why don't we see if anybody? Because we're kind of short on time, so why don't we see if there are any other comments or questions? All right. And then take them all together. Otherwise, we'll. And maybe there won't be, so just hold on for a second. There are. Benito, your mic is open. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I, you know, I listen, I watch um, Chinese government TV a lot, uh, CCTV, um, and listening to the description of the market economy in um, in Vietnam sounded very similar to what the Chinese are doing. And so I was wondering if you could say something about um, what do you see as the, uh, you know, like the, the similarities and differences between market-oriented uh, socialism in each. That's it. Okay, let's see if anybody else has a comment or question. Norma, your mic is open. Uh, I was wondering how uh, other people, you, you named one candidate for the office in their effective Senate, uh, was appointed by the CP and then vetted through the community. Um, and then you said that there were other candidates as well, and I wondered how that related to CP vetting uh, appointment, as you said. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how people become candidates for an office. You, you described one who, who was dropped out, dropped himself out after trying for a while, so I understand that. But a little bit more discussion about how people get to be candidates. People don't, here don't understand democracy very well, so any expansion of it is probably helpful. Thank you. Let's see if there's anybody else. Ben, your mic is open. My question concerns the uh, U.S.-Vietnam relationship. I was, I was interested in the, you know, what Chauncey was talking about, Agent Orange and so on. But my understanding is that there were some agreements and so on at the end of the war when the peace treaty was signed that there would be some form of reparations and I don't know if that ever happened. I don't, I don't know if I'm really right about that but the U.S. I think there was some some provision that the U.S. would try to uh, make make good on some of the war damage and so on that was done. I just wonder in, in addition to the Agent Orange question uh, what what's going on with that? Okay, let's see if there are any more. If you have a question. Okay, Tony Matheson, if you have a question, please leave your raised hand icon clicked. Your mic is open, Tony. Bottom line to me, what is any possible reason that the Viet Vietnam citizens would be friendly and welcoming the U.S. citizens? I sort of understand how 
USA Communist Party members would be greeted warmly by Vietnam citizens. Uh, but bottom line is, is it religion in their culture, or is it a pure interest in connecting with our United States nation's economic influence? Okay, thank you. Any more comments or questions? Okay, I don't see any more comments or questions for the last time. Any more comments or questions? All right, so why don't each of you uh, uh, take uh, the floor for a few minutes, respond to whatever questions uh, uh, in general, unless there were some directed toward you. And since the first one was directed toward <clears throat> Chauncey, why don't we uh, deal with it first? Sure. Um, so, yeah, with the peaceful evolution, when, and I, you know, mentioned it a little earlier, and this was something that came up while we were there, you know, when we hear, I think when we hear the word peaceful evolution, it's, it sounds like something, you know, I mean, it sounds like something nice, something pleasant, um, and doesn't sound, but what they're referring to is um, the uh, counter revolution, or more so um, those forces in Vietnam who are against the um, socialist, um, you know, against the, the Communist Party and what they're striving towards, which is uh, socialism and communism. So basically the peaceful evolution is, is basically their wording for what I think we would call in the United States a counter-revolutionary counter forces. Um, that, that's basically um, what they mean by peaceful evolution. I think... Uh, that. So do you want to respond to any other questions and make uh, closing remarks? Um, just the thing with the, um, Agent Orange, I, um, I, in the article I, I wrote regarding it, um, one of the things that I had um, um, highlighted was the, um, the unfulfilled Paris Peace Accords, which um, was something that uh, where pres then President Nixon had agreed to pay Vietnam $3.25 billion dollars for reconstruction aid and that's something that they feel um, and that hasn't been fulfilled um, uh, since since its, uh, uh, since its inception um, and maybe people might have something another a, a, a document that might have come out after that but that was the one I cited in the um, in the article I wrote that can be found on the um, on the two websites um, those were the two Anything else? No. All right, let's go. So it, respond to any questions you feel moved to respond to and, and your closing remarks. John. Uh, oh, OK. Um, yeah, just uh, continuing on that Agent Orange issue. Um, it, from what I understand, um, you know, there have been a series of uh, kind of short-term agreements that would that deal with uh, addressing the issue, and obviously, um, you know, the the uh, whatever agreement there is, it doesn't, it, it's not able to, or hasn't been able to address the enormity of the problem. I mean, as Chauncey was saying, you're you know you're dealing with a fourth generation now of birth defects and. Uh, you know, there's wide areas that have been contaminated and it's in the water supply and, and so on. But there have been these steps, uh, as limited as they are. And by the way, you know, it's no small thing to have a Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, who's, you know, a former uh, uh, Vietnam vet, but, a, you know, an anti-war Vietnam vet. And I think he has a certain attitude towards some of these issues. But what's really important is that they the, these... Uh, short-term uh, legislation that's been passed in Congress, uh, you know, expires and so they have to be renewed and um, and not only renewed but also, you know, funded. And um, so one, one important thing I, to keep in mind is, you know, what will happen if, um, you know, there's a Republican president and a Republican Congress elected in November, what will happen to some of these agreements? Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon all of us in an act of solidarity to make sure that that, that certainly doesn't happen. Um, you know, one of the uh, 
one of the things that I was really struck by uh, in terms of the relationship between the two peoples is that the Vietnamese people never have, as a people, have never had, held it personally against the American people. They always separated the American government and the actions of U.S. imperialism from the American people. In fact, they saw the role that the American people played in ending the Vietnam War and, and for, you know, ever since then have been um, so great, you know, appreciative, you know, of the role that the American people played um, in, in ending that war. Uh, but there's also a, a deep sense of humanism, you know, about the Vietnamese people. Um, and part of that is, you know, the history, you know, they've gone through, but also part of that is the spirit of socialism, you know, and the ideals of socialism that have taken root there. So that's also, you know, in the, in, in the, in the play there. Uh, just lastly, on the uh, socialist market economy, um, you know, this is the path now that Cuba's taking, too, and uh, Vietnam is 30 years ahead of Cuba, and China's even been on it for even longer than that. And one, one degree or another, you know, it's the introduction of private uh, capital and private investment um, into the economy. Um, and, and depending on the, the kinds of regulation that they have, and I think it's different in each case, I'm not familiar with China, uh, you know, their policy, but in Vietnam they have a very strict uh, control on foreign investment, uh, including in these uh, joint um, uh, partnerships where the state, in Vietnamese state, controls the majority of it. Uh, and so they, you know, it's different in each case, but it all relates to the introduction of private capital and foreign investment as a way to help build up their economies. So you're done? I am. Any other closing remarks? No. All right, so we've checked with Chauncey, we've checked John, final person standing is Roberta. Okay, so Norma, um, yeah, I didn't have a chance. I'd love to go back and write more about their electoral process, but um, as I understand the nominations for National Assembly, that the various organizations um, that make up the, um, the Fatherland Front um, each get to nominate their candidates, and they're all, um, you could say, vetted in the same kind of way through where people that they work with and people in their communities um, can, can ask them questions and can uh, their local media plays a role. I don't think there's any provision for um, uh, corporations to donate to their campaigns, though, so it's um, all on, uh, you know, on the also, Vietnam doesn't have any corporate media, at least at this point. Um, so that's uh, basically how that process works. Um, uh, I think uh, John gave a, a good answer about um, why are the Vietnamese people so friendly. And you, you, know, you hear that again and again. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the leadership of the country and even the role of the Communist Party. It's, um, inspired a sense of international solidarity and a, this kind of a socialist ethic of, of uh, friendship um, and understanding, you know, of the, the role that people play. But also, it's a very young population. It's a very, um, people are very excited. They're into technology. Everybody has their own motor scooter. They're, they want to travel. They're interested in education. Uh, they want to know what people from other parts of the world are thinking and doing. And they're not looking backward. Uh, I think they're looking forward and trying to see what uh, the challenges like of climate change and how to deal with them. So they're, you know, looking to reach out to people uh, all over the world. And I think, that, you know, that's a good note for us to uh, end on. Okay, I'd like to thank the, all of the panelists for participating tonight. I'd like to thank the participants for joining in. Please stay tuned, as you uh, could see from this uh, wonderful uh, class, that there's much more to explore, much more to look at, much more to learn. Uh, we look forward to 
doing more in the future, and uh, we hope you'll check out uh, cpusa.org uh, in terms of uh, the items that are uh, shown there, as well as peoplesworld.org, and stay tuned for future uh, classes and uh, activities. So thank you, and good night.